morning, good afternoon, and good evening from the Huntsville Ham Fest. This is um, coming to you live from Gigaparts, gigaparts.com, here at the Huntsville Ham Fest. And we're also brought to you by Ham Fest TV and QRZ.com. It's my pleasure to have Martin Jew on the, uh, on the stage here. And uh, one of the things that has caught my attention is something that I haven't gotten around to getting, but I have the seized, been seized with the tender desire for ownership of an MFJ analyzer for quite some time as somebody who likes to play with antennas. Uh, this is a, a model you brought up here. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, this is one of our newest um, uh, antenna analyzer. It's the uh, MFJ226. Uh, very comfortable, nice handheld unit uh, that covers uh, 1 to 230 megahertz. And it's a complete antenna analyzer that can uh, sweep frequencies. And um, it'll read uh, the SWR, the impedance. It reads the the resistive part of the antenna, the reactive part. It even gives you the sign of the reactant so you can tell if the antenna is capacitive or, or inductive. And uh, it can store uh, plots for different uh, antennas and you can plug a computer into it and make all of these plots in color. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, very easy to use. It's um, uh, Gives you plots for uh, each one of those parameters and can measure capacitance and resistance. And um, uh, it has an LCD that is uh, backlit and uh, it runs off of two AA batteries. Um, <clears throat> um, it's um, uh, got a uh, frequency resolution of uh, one hertz and it's got a built in uh, uh, Smith chart and it makes a uh, uh, putting antennas up and uh, trimming them extremely easy. The Smith charts are very useful, even in the age of antenna analyzers, uh, to kind of visualize, you know, impedance and uh, the value and the sign of impedance. It really does help to actually have a visual representation using something like a Smith chart. Um, well, one of the, the uh, most... Uh, interesting parts of it for this complete handheld vet, uh, vector network analyzer is $339 and you can uh, put the calibration plane anywhere you want to. It doesn't have to be just at the connector itself but it can be at the end of a long length of coax and you can make all your antenna measurements of the actual antenna wherever you are. All right, so those are three of the new products you've had here at the uh, Huntsville Ham Fest. What do you, when you look at what you're going to build, what do you, do you look at other manufacturers? Say, I know you've made uh, things like antennas for the Yezu 817, which I have. Okay. And uh, are you always looking at some of the manufacturers to see what accessories or aftermarket things can we make for the, uh, the radios well, themselves? Well, yeah. I mean, that's a big source, but also a big source of uh, product ideas is, are the customers tell us what they want. You know, uh, you know, most engineers get the idea of new products kind of backwards. You know, they're trying to design a product that they want. Well, that's fine, but the only pro problem with that is they're the only one who wants it. But if you go out and start talking to your customers, to the actual hams and the users, and ask them, and if you build what they want, then you got somebody else that wants it besides you. So, uh, you know, we, we just kind of look at the market and uh, see also what everyone else is building, and um, we can get some idea what to build. Well, we are talking to Martin Jew of MFJ fame here at the Huntsville Ham Fest, and we are at Gigaparts, located in the Von Braun Center. And right now, let me remind you one more time of the Gigaparts coupon code that should be appearing on your screen very soon now. 
That coupon is for this hour is HSV, as in Victor, 3FT. And what you will get with that, if you use that code, will be a free gift with your order anytime from September to December 2015. And, Mr. Chu, I'd like to ask you, I, I promised I'd ask you a little historical question about how you got started, where you got started, why you've remained there, and um, what are your plans for the future? Um, well, I got started, uh, oh, it's been 43 years, and uh, started at a uh, town in Mississippi uh, called Starkville, Mississippi, the home of Mississippi State University, um, and, and where we had uh, the number one football team in the nation, at least for a few weeks. Uh, but uh, we've been there ever since. Um, um, uh, all Almost all, 90% of the manufacturing is done there in, in Starkville. Um, let's you, see. Do you draw upon, say, the uh, university community? I know there's a, a strong engineering program at Mississippi State. Do you have, say, well, have interns or co-op students working there? Well, we do have some. You know, in the past, we've used a lot more students, but uh, that has changed now. Students are not as excited about working as much as they used to. So most of our employees are the just the regular, normal people within our community. And, um, and we, we have always chosen to make accessory products um, and products that we can uh, engineer once and just sell for a long time. Uh, it just makes it easier for our, uh, our people to build those products. All right. Uh, you mentioned you buy, uh, you sell accessories. You also have sold the uh, portable, some of those portable SSB radios uh, for six, two, I think for HF as well. Yeah. And they're totally analog. And you, in your catalog, you you make note of the fact that it is a, more or less an, a, a solid state radio, mm -hmm. but. It is a very straightforward, simple radio, and it's meant to be taken out uh, in the field, backpacking, other QRP activity. Have you uh, been surprised at how well those have continued to sell? Well, yeah. You know, we've, we've uh, have been building that line of product for a pretty good while. They're, they're really for the beginners, and it's just something very easy to use, and they very rarely fail because they are very simple, but... They're pretty robust uh, radios. Some of those radios have been used all over the world. Um, and it has enough power where you can talk all over the world. We've got a whole series that covers almost all of the HF band, single band radios, and a series of CW radios, some of which will cover all bands. Very low cost. We've got a uh, all band CW radio for... $230 that includes uh, all the radios and it puts out 7, 8 watts. Uh, the single sideband radios would put out 10, 12 watts and that's plenty of power to talk all over the world. I also have picked up on the fact that you have uh, made some purchases of other companies in recent years such as uh, some an antenna manufacturers and some amplifier manufacturers. How have you integrated them, or have you let them kind of do their own thing? Uh, to what extent do you have an interaction with those companies that you've acquired? Okay, well, you know, each one of those companies operate pretty much independently. Uh, they're in their own building. They have their own group of people. They set their own work time. And, uh, you know, they're really pretty much independent. I mean, there are some things that we do common, like the accounting or uh, maybe some of the personnel manager, but all the production part is done independently. They, uh, uh, each one is managed by a separate uh, group of people, um, and that's worked out really well. I mean, there, we uh, at the MFJ uh, plant, um, the production people started 
um, 7.30, and they uh, are off at 4. But at some of the other plants, they may start at 6 and get off at 3. Uh, so they pretty much set their own times. Uh, um, but all the, almost all the manufacturing is done right there in uh, Starkville. And we do things like um, make our own roller inductors, make our air variable capacitors, um, lots of the actual RF high-power parts we make in-house. Well, as somebody who has recently built an HF loop antenna, I'm very glad to see there's still a source for variable capacitors. And I, you know, I look for radios to cannibalize them from. Okay. And I, well. and, I, it, and I hate to tear up old radios, but I covet the capacitors. <laughs> I understand you have, are selling a, 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 an HF loop. That is well, an antenna I've been intrigued with uh, okay. ever since I built my home, home brew one. So. Well, you know, HF loop antennas are, are very interesting in products, and they do work, and they can be very efficient. And, uh, you know, we have a special air variable capacitor made specifically for loop antennas that's almost as uh, lossless as a vacuum variable capacitor. It's a capacitor where all the plates are completely welded and there's no rotating contacts. And that capacitor can handle up to 30,000 volts at 15 amps, so it's perfectly suited for a loop, we've, we've got two values of 75 picofarad and 150 picofarad, so you could build yourself an 80 or 160 meter loop with those antennas. I mean, we would do, we would build them for um, 80 and 40 meters, but the problem is you can't ship them. And even even though they are small loops, at those wavelengths, they're pretty big. Well, they're pretty big. Um, the, the big problem is there's just big uh, uh, surcharges from uh, uh, shipping companies like UPS. The only way to ship those things are by truck, and, and the hams, are lots of them are just not willing to have it shipped by truck to them. Well, uh, I'm kind of a late convert to loop antennas, so that's why I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, another question I wanted to ask you is... What kind of ham radio do you enjoy? Oh, well, that's a, that's a real question. Well, you know, I really enjoy using the really old radios. I'm talking about things back when I was a novice, things like the DX20, uh, the Heathkit DX20, the old Helicrafter S40s, and uh, I've just recently gotten several uh, Heathkit HW16s, they were a not a true transceiver, but a transmitter and a receiver in one box. And then uh, some of uh, the early, early QRP radios like the HW8s, HW7s. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, the HW7 was one of the very, very early QRP uh, transceiver and it was based on a uh, MOSFET FET, lots of AM breakthrough, very critical in tuning the preselector. But that's what makes ham radio fun, being uh, able twirling to twirling the make knobs and, and and finding that you can detune something by looking at it funny. Sometimes. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. or at least you need to hold your hand on a knob so it doesn't detune. Well. <laughs> Well, I've really enjoyed talking with you and, and finally meeting you after seeing you at these ham fests for several years now while you're busily uh, uh, moving product at, at, at these shows. Um, is there any question that you wished I'd ask you that you haven't been asked yet? And you have the floor. Well, let's see. That was a surprise question. Um... Okay, so that's the question. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Well, maybe I can get someone out in the audience to see if we, anyone's are, got something to ask. Are we good with that? But, uh, uh, a question from the audience? I'll, what does the F stand for in MFJ? Okay, if y'all really want to know what the F stands for, I'll tell you. It stands for fun, F-U-N. 
<laughs> you, you threw him a 3-0 fastball right down the middle. Well, uh, how much time do we have left? And uh, we, we can wrap it up. It's been a pleasure. Well, I've really you. enjoyed uh, talking with both Bob Heil and Martin Jew of MFJ here at Giga Parts on HamFest TV. We are sponsored by QRZ.com, where we're broadcasting from, and, of course, by GigaParts.com. Thank you for watching wherever you are in the world this webcast of HamFest.TV. Everybody, 73. Thank <laughs> you.